How are you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, today we're going to have a very interesting topic. I'm going to have the co-host of the Tear Talk podcast, Russ Hamilton, tell you exactly what this topic is going to be, which I feel that you're going to find very, very interesting. Russ, what is the topic? Well, hey there, Anthony. Uh, Russ Hamilton from Keepers of Chaos here. Um, anyway, guys, today, this particular topic is about lies that inmates tell. And more than just lies about uh, the lies that inmates tell, but about a specific type of lie. And the specific type of lie that I'm talking about is medical lies, all right? And, uh, you know, if you're out there, if you're a street-level um, law enforcement officer or if you're just in the general, pu uh, uh, general public and you don't know what goes on in prisons, there's only four types of injuries that inmates get. And all of those in all of those injuries are called are caused by one of four things, and that's by spider bites, that's by uh, slipping in the shower stall, that's by uh, falling off the bunk bed, or it can be caused by a basketball injury. And those are the only four ways that inmates uh, get any types of injuries inside the prison. Now I know that might sound a little bit goofy, but we're going to fill you in on why that is here in just a minute. Right, and guys. As we joke a little bit, because the lies tend to be a little funny, especially when we know that they're lying, when we know it's obvious, when we know that's not a basketball injury, or we know that, hey, that's, you must have fell in that shower multiple times. But the thing is, there's liability here. And I'm going to say something that me and Russ actually did this topic before, but unfortunately something happened with the internet. Uh, and it's great because how we do these, we don't really prepare the discussion. We kind of see where it goes because it's experience, talking with experience. I realize even as we're doing this right now that there's a really good partnership even at this level with medical and custody because we have to do our due diligence no matter what the statement that inmate says, whether the inmate said, oh, it was an injury or, you know, that I got playing basketball or, you know, yeah, I was assaulted. Either way, we still have to do our due diligence all because the inmate says it doesn't mean, oh, that's golden and we're good to go. And that's something we're going to explore. So the real key part of this dialogue is where the liability is, and are you doing enough to protect yourself from a lawsuit? And there's going to be three perspectives here. You've got Russ as a supervisor, mine from the administrative end, but we also have Connie Eileen on the show. Connie got the medical background. Connie, is this an important topic? This is absolutely important. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've had folks come in with injuries that even in the moment while we're trying to stabilize, we would have custody still trying to gain the intel because now the individual is not around a crowd of people and can actually speak freely about what transpired. You know, um, we end up getting quite a bit of information in those medical assessments because we're trying to figure out, is this an old injury? Is it a new injury? And really the body doesn't lie. When there's trauma to the body, especially new trauma to the body, we can tell. Right now, Kai, just again, uh, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience and talk about the Civilian Correction Academy? And you also have a podcast, correct? Yes. So I am Connie Aline. I am the founder and president of the Civilian Corrections Academy, where we are teaching civilians how to navigate some of the challenges behind the wall and really to serve as a partner to custody as opposed to an adversary. And The Fly Behind the Wall is a podcast that I created back in 2018 that has kind of grown a bit. You know, I initially thought nobody was listening because that was just something I enjoy doing. And then I started getting people emailing me and asking me, so what do I do with this? And what do I do with that? And custody wants me to write a report. What do I do? So it's really in, sort of evolved into its own animal right now. And I'm enjoying it. And I just found out that we were signed for season three because season two has already filmed and me and Russ did not get an invite. And the joke was funnier the first time we did it on the last recording that messed up. So I kind of added a little bit of a twist there just to get the Connie's pity laugh because I'm sure it's not as funny as, but she, she, she thank you for uh, making me feel good. <laughs> of course. But, well, I, I'm going to be listening to that podcast tonight, by the way. So don't forget to put it on my Facebook, guys. So if you get this video and you're on Facebook, check out my Facebook profile page or the Tear Talk page because I'm going to put her link up to her podcast and uh, I'm actually going to listen to a little bit when we're done here. Now, guys, if you haven't, the show Tear Talk to you, brave men and women that work in corrections. So please, subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor and when we come back. Let's discuss basketballs, bunk beds, shower stalls, 
and spider bites. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career. It's going to save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate Manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now. Link in description. And we are back. First off, I'd like to say bravo to myself for remembering all four without, you know, stumbling on any of the words or saying bunk bed twice, so bravo. Um, but again, so obviously this is a very serious topic. This is where a lot of liability comes in because, again, this is all about – and I, I want to start off with this first. Ask Russ what his perspective is as a supervisor of custody, and then I'm going to ask Connie what her perspective is as medical. But when it comes to this specific story, Russ, what does due diligence mean to you? Okay, so just to give uh, the, un the uninitiate uh, part of our audience out there an idea of um, how this thing works is we have to take um, any type of injury that an inmate gets very seriously um, if it's a possibility that that injury is caused by some sort of assault, some kind of battery, perhaps a weapon or anything like that. And part of the reason that we have to take it so seriously is even little injuries that are caused by, you know, a scuffle or a punch or something like that can blow up into something really big uh, just, you know, even a few minutes or a few hours later on because all of these inmates, they get their hackles up and, you know, there's uh, different gangs, there's different groups, um, you know, there's different intrigue going on. Sometimes, and by intrigue, I mean like, you know, somebody will maybe be doing a dope deal or they haven't paid for the dope that they had. All of these things, man, they conspire to cause some of these scuffles. And if you let it go unchecked and if you don't do your due diligence on running down some of these injuries, it will come back and it will bite you in the ass because there's always an inmate that he's been attacked once and he'll get attacked again. Or maybe he's been attacked and he's looking for get back. So he makes a shank and goes and stabs somebody over an injury that he got earlier. And so it's really nothing to fool around with. But the thing that they always tell you is the same thing over and over again. That injury, you know, a bump on the eye, you know, a split lip or whatever. It's a spider bite or it's a basketball injury or they slipped in the shower or they fell off their bunk bed. And that's about all the list ever goes to. Right now, what about for medical? What would you consider due diligence? And, and also, who would be the person in medical that would do the assessment for an injury like this and then make that determination that this is more than just an injury playing basketball? We have like those triage nurses who like that's what they do. Like they specialize in that. And then depending on the injury, there are definitely protocols that we follow to make sure that we have dotted all of our I's and crossed our, all of our T's. Because the last thing you want is someone to have gotten, say, a head injury, and then they come in and you haven't checked everything to make sure this person isn't at risk for a concussion. Or maybe you didn't review the health record to know that they had some sort of traumatic brain injury before coming in, and that this 
injury to the head isn't as minor as we think it is because it can then sort of explode into something major. So when we start that process of assessment, it, it's really a very in-depth process. And if in fact it gets to a point where the nurse feels that there needs, there's a need for an elevated or escalated level of supervision or oversight because there was some significant concerns identified, she'll pull in the medical doctor to make sure that there's a, a, an elevated assessment done that will show that either this injury is consistent with whatever his story is or it's not. Right. Now, the cool thing about this discussion is that we actually have three perspectives. You know, we have the medical perspective, the frontline custody supervisor, and the administrative level. Now, the administrative level is going to, we get the reports afterwards, but we actually see the bigger picture. We see everything where I believe when you guys are doing it, it's more of like, okay, this is what my department got going on. This is what my department's going on. And then when administration gets it, we get all the reports. We get the reports from the custody side of things, reports from the inmates, if there's any reports from medical. And then we go ahead and look at everything, including, you know, if there's an investigation going on, we try to get somewhere from the investigative department, but we also look at the aftermath, you know, where was the inmate placed, whatever. So the thing is, is the reason why we try to look at the bigger picture is because as administration, we're expected to go above and beyond, but we also expect our people to all be on the same page, which means that if my custody report, let's say, says, because this could happen where, you know, the inmate said he, he was injured playing basketball. And let's say I have a custody supervisor that's just going to take the inmate at that word without doing their due diligence. And then I get a medical report that says that uh, this is inconsistent with injuries from playing basketball. I have a problem. And I'll guarantee you both the custody side is going to come in and the medical side is going to come in. And we're going to be sitting at a table wondering, why does this report say this? And why does your report say this? Connie, have you ever had that where you had maybe an inmate that was brought to your location that had injuries but wasn't consistent with the stories that you were getting from staff or the inmate themselves? Absolutely. I mean, and not all facilities have the luxury of setting the guys or the women out to actually have like an x-ray or an MRI or anything like that that can confirm whatever that assessment is. But once we do have that ability to send out and get like confirmation, certainly that puts the, I guess, the discrepancy in a different space, in a different light. For medical you know, these physicians and the nurses have a license to protect. And so if someone comes in and for some reason, what they're saying isn't consistent, like you call into question that person's competence if in fact they just took the inmate's word for it and has not done their due diligence. And legally, when you think from a negligence perspective, like they have an obligation to make sure that whatever they're diagnosing or whatever treatment they're providing is consistent whatever that with whatever they're writing in a report right now russ obviously i, I know you would agree that the information that you would collect because we're going to break down what we would do to try to alleviate liability so we'll break down a scenario but just in the process here you'd have to admit russ the information that you would collect the due diligence from that custody supervisor and and the officers involved in collecting that evidence is very important also for medical to make their proper determination correct well, yeah, and not only that, there's a, there's a lot of effort that really goes into um, one of these things. And, uh, you know, just for those that, that don't really understand uh, why it's such a big deal is, you know, even though I kind of laugh and I, and I, you know, make fun and I poke at it and stuff, it's not one of those things that you can just let lie. Um, because, and, and believe me, man, over a career, it was one of the most exasperating things for me. Because I'm having to, you know, burn up effort. I'm having to burn up resources. Um, I'm having to do all of this chase down. And, uh, you know, generally it goes something like this is um, I'll get a report uh, probably, you know, over the radio or something from one of my housing unit officers. And he's telling me about some inmate that he's got that has an injury. And uh, so I like, okay, maybe he'll tell me what it is, what the injury is. But, you know, just say uh, he's got a bump over his eye or something like that. So then the first thing that I have to do is I have to go send um, some of my search and escort officers down there to handcuff this guy, search him, and bring him back to me. Because, you know, I, I can't just go everywhere. 
because a lot of times, you know, we're, you know, we're covering a space where we might have 1,100 inmates or something out there. So they'll bring a guy back to me. And then the first thing I do is I see his injury and I'm right away. Okay, dude, what happened? And, you know, oh, I fell off my bunk or it's a spider bite or I slipped in the shower and I fell off my bunk all at the same time or whatever. Well, yeah, now we know it's an injury for sure, but what do we have to do? Now we have to start that due diligence, which is a really long chain of events because before we can decide whether or not we can, you know, put him back in with the rest of the population, we have to hunt all of those other options down and decide that none of that happened and he is telling us the truth, but more than likely, he's not telling us the truth. Well, this is why I actually thought we could break it down piece by piece, because I really do want to introduce people to, you know, where the liability is, so we could break it down from different perspectives, you know, so basically the administration sees the bigger picture, but we could start with the front line and how the, let's say, custody will connect them to medical, and then how, what happens when we get um, everything compiled and sent our way, but it really does start with, obviously, either being called to a scene, because uh, an inmate has injuries, so let's say maybe... Uh, the inmate comes up to the officer or the officer sees it, you know, and says, hey, come here for a second. Uh, you know, basically, however it happens, the injuries are made evident and either it's to the staff or to the supervisor. And that's where it all begins, because the question is going to be first question is going to be is how did you find out this inmate was injured? And you know what's great? I'm going to be honest. With you, what really helps out is when they see that the motivation started from the staff member. And what I mean by that is the staff member reported it to me as opposed to the inmate having to go crazy and trying to find somebody to tell. I used to love the report saying, hey, the officer is the one that saw it first, told staff, and then we went ahead to the inmate because the inmate didn't want to report it. It goes to show this great initiative that staff is being proactive. So I love reports that show that the staff found it first because it just highlights, highlights that you have good staff doing their job and trying to prevent whatever chaos would happen. But Russ, I'm sure that, you know, happens with you where that notification of how the inmate got injured, whether it's from staff or from the inmate themselves. Because if you have an inmate, this is what I'm sure as a supervisor, this could get to you too, where if you have an inmate that's injured and then you wind up going to medical, find out this inmate had these injuries for days that makes you have to go back now and ask your staff, like, hey, how did nobody not see this? How is this injury already in the healing process at this point and nobody's reported it? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's part of when I start my whole, um, you know, evolution of things that I'm going to do to try and, you know, rule this guy's story out or rule this guy's story in. And so, uh, you know, part of it is, is, okay, maybe he was found in a dorm or whatever. So, I, you know, I'll recall everyone that's in that dorm. This is just a for instance. And, you know, I start with the upper body search. And now I'm looking for guys with, you know, marks on their knuckles, marks on their face, uh, any other indicators of any sort of tussle or whatever. And you know what? Maybe I find something. Maybe I don't. Um, and that's, but that's just one avenue of the thing that I have to chase down now and I have to, you know, burn up all of my time to check this guy's, and, and, you know, 99 times out of 100, it's a lie. And they'll still, you know, put you through the whole ringer on this thing. And when we come back around again and, and start touching on some other things, I'll give you a beautiful story example that I have of this and how, how it can almost, you know, destroy your whole yard. And how it can just, you know, blow up in your face if you're not really careful about what you're doing. Right. You see, when we were discussing just a, a few seconds ago about inmate injuries and inmates having older injuries, if I was administration and I'm looking down at, you know, this inmate that has old injuries, let's say medical is determined these injuries are a little bit older, I would first go to the staff and say, hey, you got to do a count. Right. So I'm assuming that you're, you're checking faces, you're making sure that these inmates are who they are. So how'd you miss this injury? It's not a body injury. I'm talking about, you know, an injury that's right out there in the open. How did you miss it? But I would also go to the inmate because sometimes what happens is you catch it. Now, let's say I see this injury a couple of days later and I say, hey, man, where'd you get that injury from? Oh, I got myself, I got hurt playing basketball. Okay, were you ever sent to medical? No, no, I didn't want to get sent to medical. Well, you are now. 
You're going to be sent now. That's one thing. And second, I'm also going to tell the inmate, when you got injured playing basketball, the first thing you should do is be reporting it. You should be reporting it because now any officer that sees that injury or any staff member that sees that injury should do their due diligence and say, hey, hold on, how'd you get that injury? I got injury playing basketball. Okay, let me just make a phone call to make sure that this injury was checked on prior. Now, I'm sure, Connie, you've had that where you could have an inmate, and I'm sure you've gotten phone calls from staff saying, hey, let me ask you a question. The inmate playing basketball, uh, he said he hurt himself. Did he ever go to medical? And, you know, yes, he did, or no, he didn't. And you ever get the calls from staff to try to confirm that? Absolutely. I mean, we used to just keep a record of just all the injury reports um, because we were an accredited facility and we had a certain amount of time that we had to be responsive to, to everything, right? You got to do this in 24 hours, this in 72 hours, this in 48 hours. And so, you know, um, I think for us, or just in general as a system, it really makes sense that we are super responsive. I think one of the things as far as medical goes, like I find that we would identify things that weren't so obvious. And so sometimes it's a limp, right? All of a sudden this offender has a limp. They didn't always have a limp. Or sometimes, you know, it's there's some discoloration on their arm, which is indicative of some sort of bruise or trauma to the skin. And so we'd ask those questions to find out. And like, you know, we'd go to the health record to see, was this something reported in their history, in their medical history? Was there a recent, you know, note that actually indicated that this person came down maybe on second shift and maybe we just didn't know on first shift that this happened and treatment should continue. So I think it's a collective effort of everybody kind of keeping eyes on them and noticing things just because that's what your expertise kind of brings you to. Yeah, I love the fact that we're also in the process where highlighting the importance of communication between custody and medical, but um, I definitely, definitely needed, but just to bring it to light. So you originally from the administrative level, at least I'm looking at the bigger picture is you're trying to understand when that injury occurred, because that's key as well. So, and again, you're going beyond the, just what the inmate tells you, but I'm also putting a level of responsibility, not just on the officers or the staff members that you know, could have seen this inmate multiple times. Let's say the inmate, you know, from the unit goes, works at different jobs, goes to school, and they've had this injury on their face for three or four days and no one's documented it. I think that's a big problem. I really do. I think that's a, a big problem for different departments that are not communicating with each other. So let's say the inmate goes from his housing unit, so gets past the officer and goes to education, sitting in class for hours with this bruise on their face, and then goes from class back to the unit. I mean, so you have the makes it past custody, but then you also have the educator that could have saw it, that could have called the sergeant and said, hey, check this out. I didn't make my class today. Looks like he has some bruises. I was wondering if that was checked on. You know, I was wondering if, you know, anybody knew about that. Okay, Connie. Do we know that we're supposed to do that, though? Like, That's where I mean, you're... From, from the perspective, I mean, I mean, just even as a civilian, right? Like, if I see something, am I supposed to say, oh, he's got a bruise on his face, I need to inform custody? Or is it a safe assumption that custody already knows? Like, what do we do? Okay, so this is why I think your training class is, is definitely needed. I would rather go ahead and make the call to custody twice than make the assumption that they don't know. So, yes, if I was a teacher and I saw an inmate come to my class I would definitely somehow privately uh, go to a supervisor. I wouldn't approach the inmate. I'll be honest with you on that because you never know how the inmate is going to react, especially because you're trying to get the inmate to snitch too. So you wouldn't do that. You would want custody to control that by basically taking the inmate into an isolated area and trying to figure out what happened. But yes, I, and, and if it was covered, so what? You know, the, you're doing your due diligence. The supervisor could say, oh, we know about that. That was reported yesterday. But yes, I, I, I would put some level because he, here's why. It, 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 I think we're talking about the diffusion of responsibility here. If we all keep on assuming that someone else took care of it, then it's not going to get done. So, uh, and I, I'm sure Russ is a supervisor, if a teacher came up to you and said, hey, uh, this guy in my class had bruises on his face. Um, I just wanted to run it by you. Even if it was already checked, I'm sure you, you're not going to get frustrated over that. You're going to probably thank her for going the extra mile or her or him. Yeah, Anthony, and more than just that, um, I think that, you know, especially as a, especially as a supervisor, um, I need to be cognizant of the fact that um, 
some of the you know civilians um, that come in there, they may not be real sure about exactly what their role is supposed to be. And also, a lot of times, inmates will try and condition staff to ignore things. You know, um, if he gets questioned about it, he's just going to say, yeah, the staff already knows about that, you know, and throw a little bit of, you know, uh, edginess their way so that it makes them doubt what their reaction is to it. And so they start thinking about it. Yeah, you know, custody certainly does know about this already. And they get put in a position where they don't feel comfortable. Well, that's especially when they should act, because that's usually a dead giveaway that, you know, either they're either they're being conditioned, um, you know, and desensitized toward things that are going on like that, or there really is a problem with that inmate's injuries. Well, you know what causes a big hesitancy between, let's say, the civilian staff and the custody staff sometimes, and, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on this if you're watching it, is I have a feeling that some of us don't like to do paperwork. So I have a feeling that when it's brought to that person's attention, there could be some people like, oh, man, you know, that's why you could have some inmates that are going past everybody, you know, without anybody noticing it, because they're like, you know what? And if I notice, I'm going to be the one that's going to be stuck with the paperwork. So give it to somebody else. So now the inmate makes it past the custody staff level because maybe that they're hoping that it can be pushed on to someone else. Maybe someone in the tied to area will catch it. And then the tied to is like, well, maybe they've already caught this already. But I think some of it has to be a fact that people don't want to get caught with that paperwork, I think. I mean, I'll start with Russ first. You, you, you think I'm, I'm kind of touching on to something? Well, you know... That's the human condition, kind of is, is, you know, people, you know, slough off and they'll, they'll pass it on to someone else. I've personally uh, witnessed, uh, you, uh, you know, maybe uh, some officer is watching a guy go by with an injury and he'll watch the guy and that guy will be going up to some other staff and he'll call him on the radio and say, hey, stop that guy and check his ID, knowing that right then they're going to check his ID and then they're going to say that he's got a lump on his face. Ha, ha, ha. It happens all the time in corrections, actually. And so yeah. it, you, you know that, that it goes on. And so, you know, really, we got we to gotta be a little more mindful of that. Um, and we've got to, you know, try and take a little bit of extra care. But it does happen. Well, you know what? If, if I noticed that, let's say that's happening. Let's say I noticed that there was an inmate that was, let's say, could have been bruised up in the dorm, but had these bruises in the dorms for a while, and finally they, it's a teacher that catches it that for some reason may have to initiate the reports. Me, as administration, I may still go back to that supervisor and say, listen, I still want reports. I want reports from the people that worked at that housing unit on all those different shifts that could have seen this injury. Because if I go to medical and they said this injury is four or five days old, I think that, you know, again, for liability-wise, you know, and to get people to step up, I may go back and say, do me a favor. I don't know why we had to find out from education four days later. Why don't I go now and everybody that worked that dorm in the last three or four days, give me a report and tell me how you did not see this injury. Once medicals give me, because, hey, hey, Connie, can you, can the assessment provide us with an amount of days that you think the injury could have happened? So yeah, usually you can. So I know that we have a tool that's used, which is sort of like a, um, it's like an age. It, it tells you the age of an injury. Um, it's one of those assessment tools that they've used, um, I think during like workers' comp cases and things of that nature. But there's a lot of tools out there that, you know, the medical team has access to that can age an injury. Plus, I mean, you would understand administrator's perspective with that, right? I mean, you as a supervisor, because I could do, I, again, I'm not generalizing, but we want to paint pictures of what we feel could happen. I know most of us would step up and do the job. Let's just say for those who don't, this is actually helping out, this dialogue's helping out the people that do their job. Would you actually expect us to go back? I'm sure you would, Russ. I know you. You would probably go back and say, wait a second. Why is this teacher catching this injury, right? Medical just told me this injury is four days old. I could pitch you right now, Russ, going back to those units and getting reports from the officers who were there that could have done the counts, could have done something that said, hey, why didn't you catch this? What's going on? 
Yeah, and you know that's that's really where being actually truly proactive does pay off. Because what I would what I would rather see in that, like uh, one of the first things that I usually did every single morning is we'd be getting ready to turn all of the inmates uh, out for breakfast. And so I would have my officers, you know, as those inmates leave, you know, looking at their faces and seeing if they have any injuries. And then guys that are staying behind, uh, because a lot of people may not understand this, but sometimes an inmate will get injured enough that they'll be, uh, you know, put back and they'll have to stay in their cell or stay in their dorm and other inmates will uh, smuggle food and stuff to them while they recover. Um, and that's no guarantee that the, the bad feelings, the bad vibes about it aren't still smoldering and it couldn't blow up into something else. But they'll be put, and we called it bed rest. But rather than see inmates on bed rest, I'd have, them, I'd have my officers rouse everyone in the whole unit. Check them as they're coming out of their dorms. Check them as they're going into the uh, dining halls and then check on anyone who's left behind in any of the dorms or any of the cells and make sure that they don't have anything, you know, obvious. You can't, you don't have enough time to go in and, and, and you know, do like upper bodies or something like that. But you can certainly look at them in the face, make them turn over, smile at you or stand up or something. There's enough time for that. And that's better than having to go back and get reports afterwards, especially if it turns into something really, really serious. Because I'd rather catch it on the front end than the back end. It's way easier to deal with. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it doesn't matter how many inmates you have in your unit as an officer, you're gonna have a face with face, face to face with every inmate in your unit multiple times a day. You have to. Even if it's not during sporadic dialogue that you have along the way, you are gonna have to identify that inmate through the course of your counts multiple times. So you can't say you didn't see it, because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, then you never looked at the inmate at all. And I find that hard to believe if you're doing counts and, you know, you're making sure that you have the right people in those bed areas. And believe it or not, that's another reason why we do counts. You know, we do counts to make sure that everything's copacetic, you know, which includes looking at the inmate and, you know, making sure that the concerns Now, how you address the concerns come out. You may not want to address that concern immediately because there could be, you know, inmates not going to tell you anything in front of his homies. You may want to say, hey after you do count, call the supervisor and say, hey, listen, I noticed when I was doing count, such and such inmate had some injuries. We may want to talk to him later or have him go down to your office, but you definitely don't want to address it on the wing. You definitely don't want to address it when they're around their homies. Now, we talked about due diligence, and the reason why we're going to cover specific stories, to have an idea where I can show you the, where the lawsuit can come into play, but definitely where great communication has to happen between custody and medical and how that communication will definitely reflect to – uh, the administrative, administration side where administration can say, wow, this is good, as opposed to seeing conflict and then going back and saying that ah, these parties weren't talking to each other. So when we talked about due diligence, we talked about what needs to be done, because if it's not done, it's going to be negligent. And negligence is a lawsuit that's very hard to ever overcome. You, you get a negligent lawsuit because you fail to do your due, due, your due diligence. That's a problem. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, the negligence is not subjective. There are certain things that's going to be expected of you that during the course of your job, you're going to have to do. And if you fail to do it, that's going to be automatically negligence. That the sad thing is, is that when the outside see it's negligence, then you better damn well know because you're more involved in this job. So trust and believe if you're being judged by them for something that's common sense. Cause I'm talking about surface stuff. You're never going to win it as it travels down the road. Cause everything, everything has the potential to go to the, go to the courts and you have to treat everything as if it could go to the courts, which means every matter is serious. So the scenario I was going to bring up today was just a scenario. Now, mind you, I don't know how policies and procedures work at every place, but I feel that this is a great practice. Uh, but if you think you can make it better, add to the dialogue because the more information, the best. We're just giving you a ground foundation. Maybe your procedure is a little bit different, but we're having some dialogue and we can learn from each other. I'm only familiar with the procedures I do, which I feel are great but nothing's perfect. So let's learn from each other. So um, let's talk about where I think we see a lot, like in a open settings, like a dorm setting or a yard where it's hard to pinpoint where it happened. Obviously if you have it in a cell, guys bruised up, wasn't bruised up before. Maybe it's a cellmate. I mean, I'm looking at a bigger area, open dorms, open yards, and you have an inmate that is injured. So uh, before I go to Russ, and then we'll get to Connie, is first off, we have to know that the injury occurred. So there's two ways that's either going to happen. And I'm talking about from the supervisor perspective, and here's why. 
The supervisor is where the frontline supervisor, and including the medical side, but, but for now custody, is where it all starts because they're going to be the one that's going to be collecting the information and organizing that information, then partnering with medical, and then ultimately overseeing those reports, probably sending it to a shift commander, and then forwarding up to the administration. So I'm really talking from the supervisor perspective because they're the ones that's going to have to connect the dots between the different um, the different reports that are going to be written based on this one incident. So however the injury is brought to the supervisor's attention, so whether it's staff that noticed something, and me and Russ talked about this before with Connie, I love staff that's proactive, where, you know, if they're walking around a yard or, you know, you know, the inmate, in this case here, the inmate doesn't go to them, but they're able to see the injury and they take note of the injury. They call the supervisor and you see on those reports that the officer noticed it, that the inmate didn't volunteer it. I love that. That means you have proactive staff. I'm sure Russ loves that. That's what we want to see. We don't always expect the inmate to tell us that they've been injured because there's consequences if they do. So we know in this part, we have to have staff that's proactive. So on this part, Russ, how important is it for staff to find those injuries and not wait for inmates to come to them and tell them they've been injured. Yeah, you know, that's, that's really just part and parcel on uh, the entirety of being proactive. And, you know, you've got proactive and preemptive uh, versus, you know, observe and respond. And, you know, if you're really going to impact the security in a major way, you have to be doing that proactive and preemptive approach. And, you know, one of those things is, you know, getting out there and looking for injuries. And in the midst of all that, you'll be doing other things too. You'll be watching, you know, inmate body language. You'll be watching group dynamics of how the groups are maybe starting to split off. Uh, maybe guys are all of a sudden all looking in the same direction. Maybe everyone's got their boots on and they've got coats on. And uh, it gives you a feeling for, you know, hey, maybe something happened earlier. Maybe we need to start investigating this. Maybe we need to put the yard down and just stop this ahead of time. Uh, but uh, that's just part of it. And if you've got the right officers uh, doing the right things and taking the right actions out there, you can, you can get out ahead of the riot, which is way better than being behind a riot. Oh, hell yeah. And then also... And we're actually kind of talking about routine stuff. I'm sure medical, medical could definitely uh, discover injuries when they're doing regular assessments and then having to go ahead and, you know, try to get to the inmate to say, hey, how did this happen? And how many times do you discover injuries on regular assessments? I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, sometimes, you know, someone comes down, my back is hurting, I need a double mattress, right? No, there is no double mattress that you're going to get. But then when you go to go do an assessment of the back injury, you actually see that there's bruising on the lower back or like maybe that there was some sort of injury or trauma to the body that is causing a discomfort while they're sleeping. At which point we do have that conversation with custody to say, hey, you know, we found something because um, for us, we don't know whether it's something of concern or not. It's just a matter of sharing the information and then you, get, you guys do whatever you do with it because that's what we know to happen. We know to trust that if we come to you and say, hey, there's something that's a little off or we're uncertain about, but these were the findings during a, a routine assessment you know, essentially, that's not us giving you his diagnosis, that's not us giving you anything HIPAA, but that's us acknowledging that there is a security concern that was raised by this particular injury that we've identified. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you that, because obviously it relates to safety and security, same thing where you have inmates mm -hmm. that can identify as, as, as transgender, due to safety and security reasons, we may have to know that, because they may have to be housed in an area where they're protected. Again, not isolated, not segregated, just watched more. Now, so let's just say in this case here, um, the, let's, let's go first with the officer telling you, okay, Russell, let's just break it down to, you know, if the officer tells you, okay, so guess what? I think that this inmate has an injury. So what the first thing is you want to see what, that the officer observed, if he says he didn't observe it, what would be your next steps? Oh, uh, you mean with respect to if if he had discovered the inmate to have an injury? Yeah. So, like, let's say an inmate come. Uh, yeah, I apologize. Let's say the 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 officer comes to you, gives you a call, says, "Hey, I noticed that I have an inmate in a dorm. 
with a, with a couple of black guys. And I think the officer is actually smart by not going up to that inmate, calling for you first, because there could be a chance that when they go to the inmate, uh, it should, I don't think it's a smart move. I think they have to isolate the inmate before they ask him those questions. So definitely calling the supervisor first, saying, hey, I have an inmate in here with some injuries. Now, I know my first question is, do you know how these injuries occurred? If the officer said no, what would be your next step? Okay. The, the first thing that I always want to do is I know that there's always a potential, potential for this to you know instantly blow up. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure, of course, that my staff are safe. So that usually involves, you know, sending them some backup or, you know, a lot of times, though, they, they can um, they have the ability to just get the inmate out of there. Um, I'm going to want that inmate uh, searched. I'm going to want that inmate in cuffs. I'm going to want, you know, at least uh, two or three officers escorting him back to me. And then uh, from that point, usually I start some kind of a, a split routine where I'm going to send uh, X number of officers, hopefully, to go do upper bodies in the area that this inmate was. Um, a lot of times I have an inkling of what happened in the first place. And so it's not always necessary for me to, you know, have talk, having talked to this inmate and actually see him because it, it might take them several minutes to walk him to me. Um, the next thing that I'm going to start doing is usually I call my tower officers and I'll say, hey, look, man, we have a inmate down there with some injuries. What does the temperature of my yard look like? Because I don't want my staff running into an, uh, you know, uh, escorting this guy into an ambush or something like that, um, because that's always a distinct possibility. So, you know, my tower officers generally tell me, uh, yeah, it looks okay. And if it looks okay, then I usually just let them continue on. Then I bring them to me, and then we start with the whole interview process, and I start collecting the rest of the evidence with regard to what my officers tell me about what's going on with their upper body search, and I just try and piece the whole thing together. And if I may, I'd like to continue this on in a story that I think that will illustrate what a lot of this is about. Yeah, I want to ask one more question first, just to, uh, and then yes, of course, I want to hear the story. Uh, just for those from the outside looking in, I'm sure one of the questions they're going to say is, I know why, but I want to ask you. So you have an inmate that's assaulted. Why are you handcuffing them? Okay, um, like I say, the first thing that I have to take into account is the safety of my staff. So I've got an inmate out there with injuries on him. And there's no accountability for that at that point. Anything could have happened. So, you know, there's a huge possibility that um, he might um, have a weapon on him. Um, there's a huge possibility that he might want to strike one of my officers in order to get locked up because he's scared of what's going on. And typically you hear this referred to as a PC move. So the first thing I want my officers to do is I want them to handcuff him and then I want them to search him. Because a lot of times they're going to come up with some reason, uh, you know, some weapon, uh, maybe some type of contraband that maybe he thought he was going to go back to add seg with. And then they're going to, you know, bring him the rest of the way down to me in a safe manner. Um, and, you know, we're going to make sure that we have uh, gun coverage up ahead and that we've uh, cleared the path so that we don't have, you know, a potential ambush set up and, uh, you know, get him off the yard and into me where I can start doing what I do, which is, you know, you know as you know, is usually the interview and so forth. Yeah, and I like how you mentioned one thing before you go into your story. I like how you mentioned uh, the fact that now you do have an inmate that was assaulted. They could be scared, but they don't want to look like they're going to snitch. So they attack one of us to get them into lock, which winds up protecting them. And then maybe eventually also getting them transferred out because when you attack staff, technically you shouldn't remain at that same facility. So it's a very well-planned move by the inmate that puts uh, staff at risk. So I think it's great that you keep them cuffed. And, you know, again, safety of your staff is paramount. So what's the story, Russ? So this is just kind of a little insight into this, uh, into this whole subject matter that we give you. And it's also going to give you a little bit, look, uh, little bit of a look into the uh, – politics that um, happen on any particular yard. So in this one particular scenario um, where I was the sergeant, I had one of my officers call me and tell me that he had an injured inmate. 
And uh, he did everything fine. You know, he brought me this uh, inmate in handcuffs. And uh, sure enough, you know, this guy, he's got a, you know, big old welted lump over his eye and everything. And, uh, and so at that point, I just kind of said, you know what, I need some guys to go back up to where this guy's dorm is and start checking that out. Because I just had a, I just had a feeling that, you know, maybe there was going to be some problems up there or something. So as I pulled this guy into my office and I started talking to him, I said, okay, what happened? You know, how'd you get your eye dotted like that? And of course, the first words out of his mouth were is, I fell off of my bunk. Okay. So, and this plays in later. So anyway, this guy is a white guy. All right. <clears throat> so as soon as he tells me that, you know, I just know right off the bat that he's lying in this circumstance. But now we're at that point where we have to go and we have to jump through all of the hoops to make this thing right. So I kind of like looked at what he had on his file and I, I looked at some of his tattoos. So I kind of knew where he was from and he was kind of from a little County and they weren't real clicked up and they weren't really much into the politics uh, up in this particular County. And I knew right where this guy was living in this particular dorm. And there's this real friendly, genuinely nice guy in there. Who's, who's a, who happened to be a black inmate. And I said to the guy, I said, Hey, did such and such give you something to eat? And you, and I could just see right then. I could just see he, you know, he went he went ash and white. And what was ha what had happened was is these guys play these politics, especially these white guys and stuff, where they can't accept you know anything in the way of food or anything else from a black inmate. And so I was like, I was like, okay, dude, I already know I hit it on the head. You may as well give up game. And he came out and admitted to it. And right then, just as he was, you know, talking about this, I get the call on the radio that says, you know what, Hamilton, you better get up here. And so I get up to this guy's dorm after placing him, <clears throat> after placing him in a holding cell, and I have the entire dorm just completely segregated and separated. And I mean, it was obvious that this was a white and black issue. And uh, I mean, we, I thought things were going to go off right then and there. So I started getting my cops in a position where we could go in and we could start handcuffing everybody. We started bringing people down. And now it's turning the whole thing because I've, I've put everybody down on my yard and I've got all kinds of guys. I've got, you know, probably 20 guys in handcuffs. And uh, I start having them march me in some of these uh, idiot guys, especially the, the shot callers, because this, this uh, particular inmate, he told me that um, – the shot caller walked up to him and told him not to accept anything from blacks and then hit this guy in the eye. But then I didn't know what the problem was between the rest of this group. So I started having them bring me in some guys that I was interviewing and I waited a few deep until I could get to a guy that I had in there that was a confidential informant of mine. And the confidential informant came in there. And I said, well, why is there a problem over this in particular? And he says, well, you know that new uh, white shot collar that's in there? I said, yeah. He said, as soon as he punched that guy in the eye and he ended up coming out of the dorm, then he started blaming the black guy, saying the black guy set him up by giving him the food. And it almost set the entire thing off. And so fortunately, what we had there was, is we did have due diligence. Man, my, my uh, tier officer and my, and my dorm officer there, they caught that guy right off the bat. Um, as soon as we got him to me, you know, I did my due diligence. Hey, guys, go up there and check what's going on right away. Thirdly, I made sure that, you know, I used my confidential informants and um, doing all of this saved the day. But it's easy just to pass it on and just say, ah, you know what? It's just some guy that got his eye dotted. But then we could have been spending hours and hours and hours up there. So you really have to watch it, especially with the, the politics that happen. A lot of people don't understand what's going on up there, but these little injuries will play right into that, and especially when you start talking about, you know, all of the STGs and the politics and everything else that goes on. So follow things through, do your reports, make sure that you run down every possible scenario before you decide that things are good for a guy to come back on the yard. <clears throat> so um, the moral of that, though, was is that because of my confidential informant, and taking that, I was able to take that asshole shot collar that almost blew my whole uh, yard up off 
of that particular unit, and he ended up uh, getting some extra time actually for that. Right, and, and it's great because, as you said, doing your due diligence led to you discovering what that concern was, which wasn't surface. It was like six or seven levels deep, and that's where, as administration, we expect our people to do that. We expect our people to do their due diligence and not accept everything from face value. That's why, like, if I when I was a supervisor and I noticed that an inmate was bruised up, immediately that inmate's going to medical, but I'm not going to talk to the inmate right away because I haven't got what I needed yet. I want the inmate to get checked by medical. I want to talk to medical. I want to talk to my officers. I want to talk to maybe some inmates on the unit. Again, do the knuckle check, do what we got to do. But I want to come up with something. I don't want to go to the inmate and say, hey, tell me what happened, because that gives him a chance to take me down these roads that I have no control of. I want to have a side of the story so I can at least control if this inmate's going to lie to me how they have to maneuver. You know, there's a lot of stress that you can add to someone when you say, let me hear your side of the story. Because in their mind, they're thinking, well, you heard something. So I better be careful because I don't know what you've heard, as opposed to me saying, tell me what happened. Tell me what happened to an inmate. They could take you anywhere. Guys, trust me on this. If ever you take anything from Tear Talk, controlling the communication is key. This is one of my expertise, I used to teach identifying deceptive behaviors, which led into manipulation. You have to control the dialogue. So by you doing your due diligence, getting information, you go to that inmate and then ask questions that are informative, but also it limits their chance to maneuver. So don't be rushing to go to that inmate first. The inmate's injured. Don't be quickly to get his story. Take him to medical. We'll discover his story. Remember something. What they write, is not may not be the story so i don't want you leaning on that to say well i need their statement to know where i gotta go not necessarily there's a story all around you medical will help tell you where to go eventually would you agree with that connie medical can definitely help custody out and kind of maneuvering where they need to go to make sure they get the truth Absolutely. I mean, because if the guy comes in and his injuries or the female comes in and the injuries aren't consistent, medical will definitely be open about that. Um, particularly because we can sometimes understand what's going on in the back end because I've had the experience of actually having the dialogue. So here's what we think is happening. Right. And so I can almost now go in and confirm like, oh, so these were the findings and this would be consistent with what you think. Right. And I think because there's this opportunity for us to work more collaboratively, it really does allow for the reporting and for everything else to be a lot more, I want to say, clear in that communication or a lot more clear in what we're actually seeing. And that way you guys can kind of also just align because now it's, if you need to go talk to someone because their report said one thing, but this is what we're finding that's consistent with what your initial, you know, thought process was like, really that gives us, that gives you more of an informed decision that you can make because now you've got some facts to deal with. Right. And as I said, from the administrative level, I'm very reliant on those initial reports, just like I'm sure that supervisor is going to be relying on medical reports. Medical is going to be relying on the supervisor's reports. And then we become reliant on both. But so anyway, so just to kind of continue to move through the story here. So eventually you are going to go to the inmate, but you're going to go to the inmate with information. Okay. That's the key that you're holding in the back of your mind. This information is going to help you guide the dialogue and basically Inmates, if they lie, lying can be very exhaustive. It, it could be. So they have to be challenged. Even if they're the ones, I said, they could be a victim. I, they could be, but we don't know that. And Russ mentioned the dangers of even if they're being a victim, the consequences, the retaliation, all that stuff. So you can't go there and just expect that this inmate's going to tell you everything at face value because they're a victim and they've been hurt. The environment tells them to do everything opposite of that which means that now you have to put the extra effort in to get the inmate to give you some level of truth or exhaust them. Exhaust them with why after why after why after why until they get tired. Because guys, lying takes energy. Lying also takes a great amount of mem memory. Let's not forget that. You know, that's why if you have information, you know exactly how to maneuver. And what happens here is, 
when the inmate starts to get to areas where they're, where they're uncertain about, because you said that you may have some information, this is where the inmate's going to start to backpedal. This is where the inmate's going to start to become hesitant. And that's where you have to attack. That's where you have to attack with those questions. I'm telling you guys, trust and believe. Because eventually they start to turn around because they just get tired. They just get tired. So why do they shut up and say, I'm done speaking? I'm not, okay, fine. Then. I know you're not telling me the truth. Or they'll, they'll just say, you know what? Gange, this is what happened. And sometimes they do that, guys. Sometimes they just get so tired because you're catching them. Here's the funny thing. Those may sound weird. It's easier to tell the truth than a lie. So most people would actually want to tell the truth, but they have to second guess themselves and then they come out with their story. But to create the story is exhausting. But now when I get the inmate to commit to a statement, that th even if the statement is a lie, that doesn't mean, or the truth, whatever it is, the statement isn't something that I'm going to say, okay, the inmate said this, I'm good, it's golden, we're in the clear. So again, we're going to explore this part now, the inmate statement. So Russ, if I'm an inmate, and you've done, again, we're talking about due diligence here, but let's say you haven't done your due diligence. Let's say you're just that supervisor that, well, Cussie didn't see it. Let me just go to this inmate and let me just see what happened. Hey, inmate Smith, you got some bruises on your face. What happened? Oh, I got hurt playing basketball. Okay, do me a favor. Do you need medical? No. Okay, that's fine. Just give me a statement that says you got hurt playing medical. And I'm sorry, you got hurt playing basketball and we should be all good. Russ, what's your thoughts on that supervisor? Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely not the route that you want to go. Um, this is one of those issues that I talk about in other tapes and things of mine where I talk about uh, critical thinking skills. You have to figure out what inmate motivation is. Um, this guy, obviously, if he's saying st stuff like that, he wants to remain on the unit. Well, if he's a victim, why does he want to remain on the unit? Well, the only two reasons are is either he wants to be that guy who he's, you know, getting his props for having stayed on the unit, or he's figuring that there may be a chance for him to retaliate. And boy, I tell you, you have to watch that because if you're only looking at it from one position, if you're only thinking about, well, this guy, he, man, he should be wanting to get off of this yard if he's, if he's had a problem, that's not necessarily so. I've seen retaliation happen hundreds, maybe even thousands of times in my career. And I'll tell you what, retaliation is always worse than the initial, uh, the initial attack that he absorbed. Um, oftentimes, it ends up being with some sort of weapon. Uh, it tends to be uh, a lot of times with, you know, a bar of soap in a sock or a lock in a sock or something like that because, uh, you know, sometimes they don't have enough time to make a shank or something like that. Um, you know, so... You've got to be really super wary on just accepting something at face value. Don't ever do it. As I mentioned before, with this issue that I had up in the dorm, this white shot collar, you know, he was four, five, six levels deep in his thinking. You know, he was gonna he was gonna screw with this uh, white guy, and then he was gonna screw everything up with the blacks as well. And then this was his big power play to try and pull something else off on the yard. Don't underestimate what they're capable of because these guys they will they'll they'll play a deep game it's like being on the top of an onion you know you only see that first layer but you know there's a thousand layers below it so be really careful and if you're going to make that call where okay yeah this is a legitimate injury uh you know make sure that you've run out and you've exhausted every other possibility until you get back to that so that if it does turn out that uh it wasn't, you know, a legitimate injury that you can say, hey, it was not a legitimate injury. We found this out later, but I took, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, however, however many different um, ways. And I made sure that it was a legitimate injury. And this time it just turned out that it really wasn't. But I did my due diligence. I went the extra mile. I ran out all of the evidence and you know, it came back the way it did. Yeah, you're, you're looking for that bit of conflict. So it means that if inmate statement, because there are a lot of people that do rely heavily on that inmate statement, thinking, okay, I got the inmate statement. I'm clear there's going to be a lawsuit because if something happens, I can always say that, well, the inmate said this. Yeah, but the inmate has motivation to lie, like Russ said. So if that gets traveled up, 
someone in your experience, because this code has become a lawsuit, they're going to look at you and say, let me ask you a question. They don't care about that inmate statement line. They're going to ask you, would there be a reason for an inmate to lie on a statement? And you working in custody, you being a supervisor, if you can answer that by saying no, then you're in the wrong business. Because at this point here, I think Corrections 101, there's a lot of motivations why an inmate could lie. Russ just threw out a few. Connie threw out a few. But, but the key here is that the statement is part of it. You know, it's something you can lean on because I will tell you this. If you do have evidence that supports for some reason that maybe it was a basketball injury. Maybe it was. It may went to basketball, played basketball. There was no knuckle. There was no bruises on people's knuckles. Then that's the, it happens. If the inmate was to challenge it later on, well, then guess what? Hey, we did our due diligence. We checked it. Maybe he was assaulted. I don't know. But I have enough evidence here to show you these are the steps we do, did, and we couldn't find a conflict at that time. Now, whatever was discovered later was discovered later, but wasn't available to me at that time. And I know Connie, right off the bat, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that if you, in medical, took every statement an inmate made at face value, especially when they could be overdosing on something, but you have to try to find out what it is, we would have dead inmates and the lawsuit wouldn't go on the inmate. It would go directly on medical for not doing their due diligence. Absolutely. So we've got people coming in telling, giving us a laundry list of medications that they're on. Of course, at least half of them are narcotics, right? And we're supposed to just continue that medication regimen because they say so, right? And so what happens if we don't do the community collateral? If we don't check to make sure this person was really in a program, was this person really taken on methadone or suboxone or something outside? I mean, even when they start reporting out, just like say when we do groups, you know, um, and they start talking about all of the things that, oh, I did this in the community and that in the community. And then we reach out to the community to see if we could continue to support this activity. And the community says, well, they didn't show up for the last five months. So we don't know what he's talking about or she's talking about. So like you learn early on, you can't believe what they say. You have to do the due diligence. You've got to check. You've got to make sure. And those assessments that we do, they're critical because they're asking all those questions that sometimes because things are so routine, you forget those one or two items, right? But because you do have that opportunity to go to what is the protocol? What does it tell me I should be checking? And you make sure because when it does get to the point of litigation, you got to realize the first thing they're going to do is go to that protocol and say, well, you did these 10 steps, but you didn't do these three right? Which puts you in a space of vulnerability. So um, it really is a matter of us doing due diligence and everything that we do with this population. Brian, I will say something. I'll forward this over to Russ. Oh, okay, Russ, I'm sorry. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, yeah, that, uh, it, that's, exactly, that's exactly it, as, as Connie was saying there. Um, and we just have to really, I think, you know, one thing that I really want to point out here, though, is there's, there's a little trap that we fall into as humans when we start uh, thinking about this particular subject um, or that I see that a lot of supervisors fall into. They always look at it from that perspective of the inmate uh, telling them, hey, I'm good. You know, I'm good. I, it, this, this was a basketball injury. And they only think about that from that side of this guy. He's not going to get clobbered again. Right. Instead of thinking, what's this guy going to do? Is he going to be retaliatory like that? Because um, as human, it, it's human naturally to want to accept that someone doesn't want to lie to us. And so um, I just wanted to point that out while, while I was while I was thinking about it real quick like that, because some people, if you're not thinking about every possibility or probability, then you're missing a key piece. Right. And, and, and Russ, don't forget. Obviously, all our work can be investigated, too. So, you know, when you go to, when you do your report, you know that all that stuff gets sent up to an investigative agency. And the last thing you want them to do is say something like, hey, so you never did body checks. You never did knuckle checks. Um, you never talked to medical to see, you know, what the assessment was. Because, I mean, that's the big part of it all. Because, God forbid, you know, if, you know, custody's not talking to medical, and you get that supervisor who just like, okay, send the inmate to medical and then takes the inmate's word 
and then medical submits their report, custody submits their report, and then you have a higher level who's not looking at everything. Because if I was, because actually the person that's in charge of the shift is the one that pieces all those reports together before it should get to the administrative level. So with that said, that's another layer of command. And sometimes lieutenants may trust that their good supervisor, that good sergeant or whatever that frontline supervisor level may be, did talk to medical. And we also think that maybe medical talked to that supervisor, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And then you clearly get these reports that are written in isolation of each other because custody took the word of the inmate. Let's just say in this scenario, guys, custody took the word of the inmate, decided that, oh, the inmate was correct. You know, I, I believe him, you know, got hurt playing basketball. But then medical wrote something in their report saying, this isn't a basketball injury. Now that gets forwarded up, right? Now, okay, not a problem. Shift commander takes the word, signs off, noted, noted, shifts it, shifts it up to administration. You know, let's say it happens on a Friday night. Administration doesn't review it till Monday, but I have an in inmate that's floating around in this unit right now for two days that could have been assaulted, either could be assaulted again or looking to retaliate because no one put both those reports together. Any comment on that, Russ? Yeah, it's, you know what, it's, it's all about follow through and it's, it's exhausting and not just the follow through, but, yeah, but, you know, just like, like Connie was, was talking about when we're, when we're talking about lies, man, you start looking at inmate lies and, and having to absorb them and listen to them. Um, man, it wears you down. I, I get, I mean, I get literally physically worn down over it. Um, and, you know, I've been lied to probably a million times in my career because, you, I mean, you just already know and you just already suspect and you, and you know that, okay, now I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to write a report and I'm going to have to have someone go down here and investigate this. And then on the sly, I'm going to have to talk to my snitches. And by the time I'm done with all of this thing, you know, it's eaten up, you know, two or three hours of my shift. And there's a lot of other things that I could be paying attention to, um, you know, even more dangerous situations occurring and, uh, you know, weapons being made and passed and dope deals going down. And all that's getting missed because me and my staff are dealing with, you know, the four lies. And you know what's funny? I don't know if we ever had this dialogue before as we start to bring this to a close. But this is actually should have been dialogue that we should have had a while ago because I know that a lot of people that are watching this are going to be familiar with everything that we're saying here. Uh, but I, I want to ask Connie one more question about body assessments. What exactly is a body assessment? What, what are the nurses looking at? Is there a possibility that they could miss an injury? So there's a possibility. I mean, I, I, you know, no one's 100%, right? Like usually if someone comes down and they say, I have an injury to my foot, the nurse is looking at your foot, right? The nurse isn't doing a full body assessment all the time unless there's some request for her to do that. So if custody comes in and say, hey, listen, we're concerned about X, Y, or Z, then the nurse knows to take it up a notch, right? But like if she does something else, it's almost as though she's operating outside of the scope of the complaint. And she'd have to be able to justify her going that extra mile if there was nothing clinically indicating she should be doing that because then there's other questions of undo and well, so why are you checking them out like what's going on right if the inmate complains about something else while in that interaction she has she can either check the other complaint or not because sometimes you've got those inmates who come down with a laundry list of things Oh, my back hurts, my tooth hurts, my this, my that, the third. And so, like, you can't tie up medical with that either. If you're here for, you know, you put in a, you put in a request to be seen, if that's the case, right? You put in a slip, you get seen. But in this situation where there is a question about a particular injury, that nurse is going to assess that area, assess what she sees, if there's something that's consistent or inconsistent, if there's bruising, if there's lumps, if there's any... 
um, blood vessels erupted. Like she's looking for all of those things. And usually there's a protocol that will say, if there's an injury to a knee, here's the things that you should do. If there's a head injury specifically, here are some things you can do. Because the last thing that you want is to be that nurse who did that assessment and then the inmate dies tomorrow because you didn't pick up on the fact that he might have had a concussion or he had a history of something that this minor head injury has now led to a bigger situation. So that assessment is usually very, very um, rigid, especially because of the nature of the complaint. Right, and I would also, hey, boss, before we go into closing, we talked about collecting the evidence. We talked about, you know, making sure we have information before we confront the inmate. I, I don't know. This is what I would do. I, I want to just make sure we're on the same page. Part of that information is that, that assessment. I would definitely not talk to the inmate who got injured until I received the medical assessment first. Doesn't mean there's some, I'm sure there could be some small dialogue along the way, because it happens, you're walking the inmate to medical, you know they're gonna be some dialogue along the way, but me as a supervisor, I mean, I can let the officers collect whatever information they want, but me as a supervisor, I wanna be more informed. You know, I wanna have information, I wanna challenge the inmate more, so I may even go back to the officers and say, hey, do me a favor, when he was walking down with you to medical, or she was walking down, did he say anything, did she say anything? So again, collecting information, but before I go to approach him as a supervisor, I definitely want to do my due diligence, yes, but I also want to have that medical assessment. Well, I, I would say yes, I, ideally. Um, I, would, I would do that, but if, I'm, but if I'm, you know, running my program and I'm trying to get, you know, my officers back from medical and because I want, because now, you know, I want as many officers on my yard because this thing could blow up and, and all those sort of things, I may not wait. And it's going to depend on what my level of comfort is in, in dealing with it. And, uh, you know, most of the time, most of the time, these guys, they give themselves away and you can, and you can run it out with it without having to have that. Um, I also have to look at just how, um, at just how helpful I'm likely to think that the medical assessment um, is going to be. Sometimes it's very helpful. And then sometimes, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things where, you know, we're not ruling anything in, we're not ruling anything out. And so we have to have some other way to go about it. So, yeah, like I say, I, I think that ideally I would do that, but it's, it's not always in the cards. But you would definitely have a dialogue with medical to ask what the injuries were oh, before you. Yeah, but it's uh, but it's a matter of you know if, if I'm not going to be able to have that inmate seen for an hour or two, you know, and and I'm having to run and I'm having to do everything else first, then you know maybe not. Yeah, so I I, I guess I mean obviously. As a supervisor, usually if I'm really good with medical, which usually I am, I could have the inmate assessed immediately. I don't know how that would work in other facilities. Um, but as a supervisor, if I came in with someone that was injured, I don't know how it is again in other places, but I may go to the head nurse and say, give me a favor, I need to have this inmate check. And they would maneuver a little bit and work with me because they also know there's a priority. And again, head injury, we don't know what's going on. Um, you know, So usually I'll be able to work an angle, but, I, but I, I agree, if I couldn't get the assessment, I would definitely want to talk to medical, but again, I'm talking from the supervisor's perspective who may be able to get that assessment where if you're custody, yeah, you're gathering some information, but you're giving it to the supervisor so they're more informed when they go ahead and have to challenge the inmate who's going to uh, lie. Again, Connie. So I was just thinking, suppose you are like that officer who doesn't have the experience that you and Russ have, right? Because it sounds like there's a, a significant amount of judgment you have to be able to use in these situations as well. Like, what would you tell that officer who's trying to figure out what's the right thing to do and whether or not he could actually depend on his judgment in the situation? All right, so we just made it on Connie's podcast. Okay, so Russ, can you go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, there, there really is, there's, there's no substitute for, for that experience. And, you know, by the time, you know, I'm done being a supervisor, you know, I've called the shot on, you know, inmate injuries, you know, eight, 10, 12,000 times, probably something like that. There's, uh, 
you know, there's no way to try and, you know, just tell this particular officer that there's some kind of form or some kind of protocol to follow. Um, there are definitely certain things he should do. Um, but sometimes, sometimes you just got to run with that gut and that gut, you know, it gets honed, you know, it gets sharpened by experience. And so um, what I like to tell him to do is, is just think of as many scenarios as you can and as many things as you can that are likely, not completely crazy stuff, but that are likely to go wrong and then try and work it back from there and figure out, okay, um, if I make this call um, and I'm wrong, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? If I'm, you know, and just let them work from there and try and let a person see what their options are. Because, you know, options whittle down. You start, you start at the top of this little scenario, the little, um, the little uh, incident that we're talking about involved in, you know, you've got, you know, you've got, you know, 30 different options and then you select one of those. And then maybe the next level, then you've got 10, five, four, three, two, one. Well, if your last option turns out to be really crappy because you've made mistakes along the way, then you know. And so that's why I try and, I try and talk to them. I try and talk to them about what their options are and why they're telling me what their crap option is. And I'm going, no, that, that was not a good idea. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of I agree with Russ. I think that I look at officers that are experienced as playing chess, new officers as playing checkers, because they're kind of just automatically reacting where the new officers are, are the old officers. They're kind of playing chess. So in a perfect world, in a perfect world where I can partner experienced staff with uh, rookies, I'm going to try to be able to do that as much as I can, especially in moments like this. I may have the experienced officer take the lead in whatever little dialogue that's going to happen, because believe it or not, walking that inmate, from point A to point B, dialogue happens, you know? And I think that's the time for that senior officer who may know that inmate, because most of the time it really is the officer knowing that inmate, and then maybe the inmate having a trust for that officer where they may decide to tell the officer the truth. But definitely, believe it or not, as passive as it may seem, that experienced officer is controlling the dialogue, and I think that's a lot for that rookie officer to learn, how to control that dialogue. But that's in a perfect world. That's if we're able to have enough manpower to be able to, for, for rookies to sit back and watch experience officers. But you're right about something, Connie. We don't have that in a lot of places. We have people that are rookies that have to jump right in because the numbers are low. And, you know, and then we wind up putting them in positions that require a lot of discretion. And unfortunately, you know, they don't have that. They don't have that because they don't have the experience to have that discretion. So it, it, it's, the only thing that I could say is that, um, you know, you can cultivate them as best you can. Um, but I would like to think that the people that you're bringing in, they're there because they can adapt or adjust. But I would try my best not to put them in positions that are really defined by, um, especially as a rookie, defined by utilizing discretion. Like I, that to me is, is a position where you're going to wind up having to it's the communication, to be honest with you. It's the communication. It's the dialogue. It's, I would really would love for them to observe and watch, but if that's not given the opportunity, then that's a good test of the rookie, you know, because I'll guarantee you, and I know Russ would say the same thing, a good supervisor may give him the chance. Like when I was in administration and when I first got the job, my boss was amazing. When I came in, I have no policies on what I do. We create policies, you know? So basically when I came into my administrative position, I don't have anything I can read. All I have is my experience, but it's different now because I'm put in a whole different role. So basically this person told me this, which was the best advice I ever had. Sit in your office and don't do nothing for two weeks. Observe, interact, but don't make decisions. Don't do anything. Just observe. And, and there's interaction. I did that for two weeks, literally. Saw the movement going on, got myself caught up with this routine of things, saw where the different departments would go to different people, started understanding the, the department's roles. Because again, I only had custody. I didn't know what the other jobs were. So during those two weeks, I could see routine stuff. I could start to see routine. But the funny thing is where I developed discretion happened because sometimes we deviate from the routine because shit happens. But as long as I know there's an end result, 
I can employ discretion in how to get there. But when I don't know what the end result is, like, so if I'm this rookie officer and I don't know what the end result is, I don't have, I can't employ any discretion, you know? So when there's shit that's going outside of policy, you know, I, I, I don't know it. I, don't, I, I won't be able to employ any discretion because I don't know what the end game is. So when that person told me to sit down and observe, what she was telling me to do is look at A through Z. It's never going to be a perfect route. But if you know where A is and you know where Z is, that's where the discretion is. The discretion is bringing everything back to the end route. And then finally, after two weeks, because remember, I did have some experience. I was custody. And it's not like I'm blind to the profession. Um, so I didn't have to, stay, you know, I, I would say for other things would be a lot longer, but for this case here, she cut my wings and I learned how to maneuver because I took time to get an understanding of where we needed to be. So again, I would like to think that you could tell this rookie, observe, if you can learn, find out what the end games are and your ultimate end. Cause even with Russ, even when we're scrambling, Connie, even when you're scrambling, you know what the end result is. So the discretion that has to be employed is when something is so far out of policy that you have to try to bring it back. I mean, that really is when you're employing discretion where, you know, there's conflicts between different departments or, you know, maybe something here that's not normal. There's no policy for it, But what's the end game? The end game is this. Let's employ some discretion. So that's a, 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 a great question. I think that's, that could be a topic on its own. When to employ discretion. What is discretion? Um, hey, Connie, you have anything you want to say in closing? Um, I just want to say that, you know, I think these conversations are really great for us to have. But I also think that we have to remember, like, our audience. And sometimes, because I know many of the civilians are like, oh, my goodness, I didn't know what they were talking about. Or, I never had that experience before. And so sometimes I think we're talking like so big picture, a higher level because of the amount of experience that we've had that some people just can't even relate because they haven't gotten to that point in their career where they've even faced this decision making point yet. Right. And so um, my questions really are to kind of just help us remember that there are some people who haven't even stepped foot in a facility yet. And, and, and so they don't have the context for like all the stuff, like, cause even as Russ was explaining about looking for like bruises on the knuckles and, you know, upper body, I was like, wow, like I didn't even think of that. Like I, in all the time that I've worked in facility because I'm not custody, I've never thought about looking at knuckles. Whereas like, I'm like, that makes sense. Right. <laughs> but it makes sense in my context because now it's like, OK, yeah, from a medical perspective, you can tell if there's bruises on a knuckle that clearly someone had an altercation. If someone didn't just punch a wall. Maybe they did, you know, after a phone call or something. But and, you know, for me, it's like these are great, great conversations because I feel like it gives the people who are more seasoned you know, uh, a space to kind of relate and get other information. And then it kind of gives some insight into folks who've never even crossed the path yet to kind of keep an eye open and be aware that these are some of the things that could happen. So like, I'm excited about the conversation and for the nursing and medical, like when we get into these situation where custody is asking us, Hey, can you check this thing out? Like, I think that there's nothing wrong with us being agreeable. So I get it. You know, we all have got a lot of work to do and well, this is just something else custody wants me to do. But I feel like our reality is that as we learn more about the security that goes on on the back end of things, the request isn't just because they want to keep you busy. The request is because there's something else. There's pieces of the puzzle that they're putting together. And we have to be a part of that process to help put that together. We can't say we want to be a part of the intelligence, but then we don't contribute our expertise when we have the opportunity to. I'm going to tell you something, Connie. What you just said now was powerful. Uh, besides the closing, I like that, you know, being a piece of it because we do rely on you. But also you mentioned something about what we provide, which is spot on. I had someone come to my office today that watches the show and she said, you know, I'd love to see more things about programming, but I do enjoy um, Connie's perspective on civilians, but you think you can do something? I said, you know what? You're right. Cause we're starting to develop into different audiences 
and we have to find those specific topics. But here's the cool thing. We're bringing everybody together, you know? And I like what you said because I just thought of something right now. For a while, you know, you have the rookies that are coming in and we do content for the rookies. But then how do we keep the experienced people who it's too one-on-one for them? What can I learn from I have 15 years in? This is a dialogue that I think would be for those people that have 15 years in, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not perfect and I would love for them to give us some dialogue, but I think this is something you're right. And we have to remember that. And that's why I think it's great that we put out that these are for the supervisors. You know, this is a good conversation for supervisors, but then, you know, we're doing something that we know is meant for rookies. Maybe you're right. We should, I don't, I'm not, don't think I'm not, it's simplifying it. You know, why not? Simplifying it. That's the truth. I don't, I don't want to, but simplifying the information and let, making sure that we know that this is the specific audience we want to hit with this episode. I, I think that's uh, really spot on advice. And, um, I appreciate that. I think I'm going to take that with me now as I move forward. You just gave me something that I think will help me out and that I'll, I'll take with me uh, now as I move forward with the show. That, that, that was really spot on. Hey, Russ, uh, what's your closing thoughts? Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, if you guys are just getting into this business uh, or, you know, maybe if you're on the civilian side and you haven't been exposed to this and you start thinking about, you know, how inmates lie, why they lie, what are their motivations, uh, you know, those four ways that they get injuries, just keep thinking about that. Um, you know, it may sound simple, but you start thinking about it from that perspective, it'll unlock a lot of different things for you, and you'll be able to get inside their minds and be able to do all kinds of Jedi mind tricks and stuff. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I'll tell you something, guys. This was a very, very good dialogue long dialogue but we didn't repeat anything it just went from one step to the other guys don't forget keepers of chaos on on facebook and also don't forget connie's got a great training school for civilians civilian correction academy easily be able to find that you just search it connie eileen civilians corrections academy it's all over facebook all over linkedin and then the two podcasts uh what are the podcasts the fly behind the wall (laughs) and and conversations with connie Wait, wait, hold on, wait, wait, hold on. I got what the fly behind the wall is, but you're going to send it out to me in a few minutes. I'm going to share it, but let yes. me go. What's the, what's the conversations with Connie about? So that's just more focused, right? So like we just pick a topic. So for example, today's topic was about, um, we talked about why do, why do we work in corrections, right? So they're the top 10 reasons why people stay in a traditional job and they don't necessarily apply to corrections, but there's ways that, those top 10 could be reasons why you stay and you can create those reasons as you go along. So your own personal mission may change over time of why you guys started, but it's all about being in alignment with what DOC is actually trying to do and not being in your own sort of space of creating chaos. (laughs) All right. So guys, if you're watching this, I'm going to put both these links on my community for uh, YouTube. I have a community board on YouTube. Don't forget to check it out. And I'll put it on my Facebook profile page. Uh, hopefully she sends me a like, so I'm going to listen to the fly on the wall. Uh, hey, Connie, real quick, I'm not going to have you do the closing. If in turn, you maybe give me a sample of the opening of one of your podcasts. Um, so Every I don't podcast really... has an opening, Connie. <laughs> <laughs> so really, it is just Welcome to Conversations with Connie. <laughs> Today, this is what we're going to talk about. <laughs> it's a fabulous opening. Fabulous. All right, Russ, you can do the closing. All right, hey, everyone. We just want to thank you for being here with us. We want to thank you for sharing in this conversation. Remember, Tear Talk is for the brave men and women in corrections. Uh, be sure and, uh, you know, hit that bell to subscribe, get notified every time we post new content, all right? But above all else, stay safe. And on that note, guys, love you.